I'm Danielle. I know most of you have seen me down on the main desk. Part of my reason for doing this, though, is when you don't see me on the main desk, I'm upstairs cataloging different things. So I figured it would be cool to show everybody like the backside of libraries that you don't see. The books don't just magically appear on the shelves. We actually catalog them and cover them and do everything with them before they come down here. So I figured it would be pretty, pretty cool to look at that side of things. Feel free to interrupt me at any point in time if I am talking too fast, too softly, or if you have a question, all of the above will probably happen. So feel free to interrupt me at any time, wave your hand, say something, jump slow. like Carol, slow do the thing. Slowly, slowly. <laughs> that, that would be my first thing, just slow down. Just yeah. I tend to talk really quickly when I'm hyper and I'm really excited about I'm this, so I'm just like, <laughs> if I start going too fast, she's like, stop. No, do something <laughs> to calm me down. Yeah. Record it. Yeah, I, I am. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I am recording, so <laughs> it'll be so much fun. But see, so yeah, I see her the libraries. We're actually going to do this. So we're going to start out looking at new items, and then we're going to go to what happens when not new items are technically old items. I like to call them old news just to mess with people. Um, and then what happens when an item leaves our collection and you no longer see it on the shelves. So to start off with, our ordering process. It's a long, tedious, fun process. <laughs> I have nothing to do with it, and it's wonderful, so I had to ask other people on this one. For ordering, we order from Baker & Taylor, Ingram, Midwest Tapes, and Blackstone Audio. Baker and & Taylor and Ingram are both for books. Typically, Baker & Taylor is our primary. They have adult, picture, chapter books, all of the collections. Ingram we primarily use for things like standing orders or children's picture books. We get the best discounts. That really influences where we order the most is where we can save the most money because obviously we have a budget. That's our main goal. Get you as much stuff as possible for the least amount of money possible so you have more money to be able to buy more books later. <laughs> so those are those two. And then Midwest Tapes is our DVD collection for both um, nonfiction and fiction. So that's where all of our DVDs come from. We never order from anyone else. And then Blackstone Audio is actually our new provider for our audiobooks. We used to be through someone else who I just don't remember. I don't remember who we used to be through. But Blackstone kind of bought everybody out. So we're just through Blackstone now. So Baker and Taylor is basically Yeah, they have their own warehouses. They actually have a warehouse over in Ashland um, where they do some processing of like cataloging and stuff because a lot of the times when we order stuff from like Baker and Taylor, we get a pre-made partial record from them. So it's kind of nice because we can just edit it how we need it and don't have to put all of that information in ourselves. The others, it's all fair game. You have to put it in yourself and it's tedious and awful. Mm -hmm. I promise I love my job. <laughs> But Baker and Taylor is pretty much the Walmart of booksellers. But they work with the publishers to be like that weird middle man to get us all of our stuff. Do you have a question? Yeah. I know, I was just going to say, the okay. couple of the libraries I've worked in, school libraries I've worked at, where they get their, their books to Baker and Taylor. Mm -hmm. and we, I, we were always so glad when they came with the pre printed catalog cards. It is so great. <laughs> Yeah, otherwise, one of the other ladies is one of the secretaries, and she had to type all these yes. cards herself. Oh, that was nice. And it was interesting because I'm actually in grad school right now for like cataloging and stuff, and I'm in a collections management class, which fit really well with doing this program. And hearing from like outside sources and like larger conglomerations, I guess, that Baker and Taylor is just the mainframe was just weird because I was like, oh, well, it's just us that uses this. No. Nationwide, Baker and Taylor is the main one. Some people still like Ingram because sometimes Ingram does have better prices, but primarily Baker and Taylor is like the top dog for just print material. So any kind of book that you're supposed to be from there? <laughs> Pretty much. Typically the only ones we get from Ingram are our picture books and the Harlequins because those are standing order and they just send them to us every month and then we get them automatically. But I will talk more about Harlequins farther down. Yeah, I have standing orders on your guys' stuff, but not on my slide. 
Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, those are really the only things we order from Ingram, but everything else all comes from Baker and Taylor. So like all the adult fiction, Baker and Taylor, every single thing. Yeah. <laughs> we get a lot of Baker and Taylor boxes. <laughs> I was gonna say, they haven't been around as long as Ingram, right? No, because I used to work at Waldo's and I remember seeing the Ingram boxes. So yeah. Baker and Taylor's kind of. I think Baker and Taylor yeah. came about in the late 10s or like early mid 10s. It's the same. She said she had some, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I loved Waldo's when it was still around. <laughs> yes, me too. I miss it terribly. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's another discussion. <laughs> but yeah, Baker and Taylor, for whatever reason, is just okay. the top thing. Yeah. But then, who orders what? I have a list on there. I didn't want to add an extra slide and just make it really oppressive. But um, so, Gary Branson, I'm sure most of you know, he primarily just ordered all of our general fiction. Um, large print, stuff like that, so <coughs> any of the romances, the regular fiction, uh, all large print, westerns, mystery, all of those are Gary's picks. He has a catalog, I think Baker and Taylor releases it, but you can get it from other places too. The forecast, he also uses multiple other sources to look and see what's being talked about, what's going to be popular, different stuff like that. Obviously we're going to get all the new Pattersons because he's huge. Danielle Steele, you have all those like cemented in authors that no matter what everyone is going to want. So those are a given. They're practically standing orders at this point. Um, I know some of you probably noticed when we started opening things back up again after COVID, we didn't order nearly as much. And a lot of that is just because we don't have the people anymore that we used to coming in to borrow. So we don't need four copies anymore. We don't have those branches that we were sending them to. So now we don't get to maybe three copies of those super popular ones like Patterson and stuff like that, just because we don't have the space on our shelves for that. So we just maybe you gotta deal with the holds list a little longer and only have a couple rather than having multiples. Which brings me to a question that's been in the back of my mind for so long. Every month you guys get so many, I look at books in focus now and then, that's yep. just a part, little Very thing. small chunk, yeah. Where are you putting them all? How often do you have to read the shelves and pull old books? I will get to that. I'll get to that. <laughs> so that's the that is at the end. But yes, the, the and we'll be answered. It's like, it's like there's a yeah. library somewhere. We just keep expanding the library. Expand it. Well, in on a regular basis, so I'm the one who brings them down on Tuesday mornings and like checks them all in and gets all the new books on the shelf. On a regular basis, like you've all seen our carts, I have an entire side of that and plus I have another side, so about like a shelf and a half of just new stuff for that one week. Mm -hmm. So times that by four in a month, you have a cart and a half load of books that come in every month, mm -hmm. not including those that aren't street days that aren't just coming out on Tuesday. But we have stragglers all the time. Every day, our processor brings down new books. It's a constant cycle. <laughs> We find ways to make space, <laughs> but I will get to that. <laughs> but then Summer, some of you might recognize her from the desk. Um, she's not down there. She's down there super frequently now, but it used to be. She's actually been here since 92. She is our longest employee. <laughs> she orders all of our inspirational. She also is the one who does all of our ordering. Everybody puts stuff in carts. She's the one who processes the carts, makes sure things are paid for, different stuff like that, and does all of the technical processing, making sure things get here, sending stuff back. All of that is summer. She touches every single book in this building at least once. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gary Butler does science fiction, audiobooks, um, our movies, and I think he has another collection. So those mm -hmm. might be it. But he is our huge science fiction one. Um, also remember this list, if you guys ever have any suggestions, hit that person up specifically and be like, hey, I know you ordered these, give me this book. And they'll probably do it. So that way if you just wanna nudge them and be like, hey, <laughs> there's a new sci-fi coming out. Hit Gary up, that'd be great. Um, Whitney is our children's manager. She was actually out on the desk when you guys came in. Um, she does all of our juvenile nonfiction, and she used to do all of our chapter books and picture books as well. But since we hired a couple of new people, she was able to pass picture books on to Madison 
and the JPEG onto Danielle, the other Danielle. <laughs> and then Katie is our team librarian. She does all of our team ordering via graphic novel, fiction, nonfiction. All of that goes through Katie. So Miranda and Patrick had to take over all of Megan's responsibilities. So as I was saying, Miranda does the 100s, 900s, and DVDs, and Patrick does biographies, 200s, and audiobooks. And they just kind of tossed up the 300s to 800s and are like, whoever gets to it that day gets it. Because <laughs> that was Megan's chunk. So they're just like, somebody will order it. It's getting ordered. So they're managing. Yeah. Um, things that we never order unless it's by absolute accident are textbooks, work activity books, and signal, like sign weird bindings just because those don't last long in libraries. Textbooks will get stolen. The amount of ACT prep and SAT prep that we go through is insane. Work activity books, obvious reasons people are borrowing those and you can't actually work them. But what do they do with the ACT? Like how, how does it work? What's the people steal them. Yeah, people steal them. They steal them. No. They like either... They, like they have a record? Yeah. Sometimes people just don't check them out. Yeah, they'll just walk out with them. Sometimes they'll just never come back afterwards and they'll just have a fine on their account. So it just depends. They just disappear and never return and it's sad and we order a new one. So that's a constant thing. I have a question. Yeah. So who orders like medical books, like things for medical or stuff like that, the medical science books? And that falls with Patrick and Miranda currently. That's in their like no man's land section of whoever gets to it gets to it. So yeah, um, they're the two in the office upstairs if you ever just wanna like knock on the door and be like, hey, I have books, <laughs> do the thing, feel free. <laughs> they're up there in the fishbowl for a reason. <laughs> uh, and then standing orders, I think I have it on your guys' sheet of what their standing orders. Okay, my notes are different than what you guys have, so I'm not sure what all I took off to put on your guys's. Um, standing orders are Harlequins and certain <laughs> children's books Geronimo Stilton comes out sporadically every month to month and a half. They just appear and I catalog them. And then Harlequins, because they're a monthly thing, instead of having to go in and constantly like, oh, we're ordering all the presents now and the desires and all of those, like they just come monthly and I put them in the system. Do those get, yeah. I'm sorry, do they get kind of tipped when I do it? I mean, sure do. do. <laughs> I am the one in charge of all of our Harlequins, and I will fully be honest, I get a sick pleasure when I leave that section every month, because I'm getting rid of them. <laughs> yeah, standing orders is on Yeah. But yeah, Harlequins are one of those, like, they're a love-hate relationship here, because they're paperbacks, and they're really cheap, that we're just like, they don't last, so they're only here a year. But it's like they get a year's lifetime. And I got really happy when there were two of the collections out of the Harlequins that I could get rid of because nobody was using them. I got so happy. <laughs> I was like, yay, we don't need these anymore. But so that's selection process. And then, so now we're getting into the more technical upstairs sort of things. If it wasn't late at night and nobody was up there, I would have taken us on a tour of Texer. But nobody's up there right now, so it's just a creepy dark up the office. So, you get lots of pictures. <laughs> there are also close-ups on the second packet with the um, PowerPoint, that's what I'm looking for, on it. If you guys need me to zoom in on anything, because some of it's like just enough out of focus that you might not be able to see it, I will try my best to do so. No promises. <laughs> but so when we receive items, we get a packing slip in the box, the books, and that's it and we get to match everything on the packing slip to the book. We use these little tags so that we know that we've actually like received them and we do check marks on all of our packing slips and stuff so that we know that they'll be accounted for. Rarely do we have books missing, but it happens. Um, sometimes like recently we got a duplicate when we were only supposed to get one. So then we have to call later and Hannah and be like, we got an extra, do you want us to send it back or do you just want us to keep it and pay for it? Or we don't want to pay for it, we only ordered one, and it's like, nah, just keep it. It just depends. That's typically when we notice if there's like a defect with the book. My favorites are when they're printed upside down. That's great. <laughs> Sometimes it's fixable. A lot of times they'll be printed upside down, but if you flip the dust jacket over on it, it's fine and nobody knows the difference. 
Um, you can tell if you like pull the dust cover back and the spine is upside down, but nobody does that. So it's fine, it reads the same. But sometimes there are pages missing, and every now and then we'll have a book come in where like 30 pages are missing, and we're like, that's not helpful. So we have to send it back and get it back and everything. You don't, you don't page through every single book to make sure all the pages? No. Wow, Nine mean, times out of 10, we rely on patrons for that, and they're like, there's some missing. We're like, oops, sorry, we'll fix that. So, yeah, we don't, we don't have time for that. <laughs> yeah, I one more thing, I'm sorry. No, you're good. Before COVID, um, like there would be, like books in folder set, mm -hmm. with stars and everything. The library would get arcs and, and give them away to us who are attending, yes. and I haven't seen an arc in like years. Do you get it to bed for your copies? We still get some, not nearly as many. Um, I don't know why that sort of like dropped off. Hmm. I have no idea. I think it's kind of fun. Yeah, I mean, we do still get some, yeah. yeah. I didn't know why. Because now a lot of the arcs go through what's called net gallery, and you have to you have to read it online. There's I very few, you. yeah. Um, publishers, especially when ebooks and that kind of thing went into, um, uh, a lot more people were reading, you know, ebooks and you know, Kindles and that sort of thing. Um, there is a uh, an app, and it's called NetGalley, and it's open to librarians and you know, regular people, <laughs> mere mortals as well. <laughs> And um, you can uh, get um, galleys on there, but you have to read them online. So it's just like the people that would write um, reviews on Amazon. Yeah, sometimes they use NetGalley, and sometimes there's a, another app called Goodreads where you, you can give away. Yeah, they'll do giveaways, giveaways yeah. and you get a, an arc. But that's yeah. how I get a lot of mine is through Goodreads. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, advanced reader. That was a good question. She asked what an arc was. Oh, it's an yeah, advanced sorry. reader's copy. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. So <laughs> I forget sorry. that not everybody knows that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there are a lot of random things. If you don't know what it is, say, hey, what is that? Because I tried to keep the jargon at a low, but sometimes it happens. <laughs> yeah, but we would get advanced copies. Most of them were partially unedited and stuff like that. And then they have a final copy. Sometimes the cover was entirely different, where the title would change. Like that. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we mark everything with a little slip and put a barcode on it. And that's our final product that goes to me or Amy. And then this stuff kind of goes through. You can kind of see it. So like, do I have a, I don't have a laser, laser pointer. Well, that's right. So that like, these lines right here are titles. And then all of these below here are date lines. So like all the bold lines that you see are dates. Those are our street dates. We are not allowed to release books before that. Rarely do we have full embargoes on things, but that happens. Um, so especially like with the Harry Potter books, those had embargoes, you could get in serious trouble if you put them out beforehand or if anybody was allowed to use them beforehand. With street dates, it's not as strict. Working here has its perks and you can read things before the street date because we just take them off our shelf. <laughs> but they're not available to the general public before that street date. So that's why Tuesdays, every Tuesday, except for James Patterson, because he likes to be different. Tuesdays are always our street date days when everything gets released. Patterson likes to come out on Mondays. The majority of the time he's still put downstairs on Tuesdays though, because we don't like to make him special and we're not making an extra trip downstairs to do it. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, we're like, nah, he can stay upstairs, that's fine. <laughs> But yeah, typically Tuesdays is when we get our new releases. You'll notice new titles, our facing and stuff like that. Every now and then, which it rarely happens, I have nothing new to put out on a Tuesday because everything was put on hold ahead of time. So it's all going on the hold shelf. Rarely do we have a week where there's a street date that doesn't have at least one title. We have had that happen where there's only one thing releasing on that day. Last night we were upstairs, we had three things for tomorrow. There's probably more by now, but we were getting a little skimpy. And that also depends on when we get books in. Sometimes we don't get the book in until after the street day. So if it's past the street day, we can just put it downstairs immediately. It just depends on when it comes in and stuff like that. So there's that. But so you get the title and everything and we match it to the ISBN. Rarely is it incorrect, but we're still technically supposed to match it to the ISBN. Um, <laughs> 
and then pricing it also because if we have a record that's come in from somewhere else it doesn't necessarily have the right price or in the case of ingram we get no record so we have to put the record in ourselves and we have to put the price in and stuff and that's how we know what to charge you guys if you don't bring our stuff back mm -hmm. so yeah <laughs> And then that's the whole thing. So up at the top, you can see where it has like the price, and then like the six, seven, because I started the project back in June of where things were coming out on the seventh. So that was our street date marker. It's literally just a tag for Amy and I to know like, hey, don't give this book to Sharon before then because it'll be bad. So that sort of thing. Um, so I keep mentioning Amy and I, we are our only two catalogers. Amy does all of our adult fiction, nonfiction, audiobooks, Spanish, and anything that needs an original record, meaning anything that does not come with a record or I can't steal it from it in the library. We do that a lot. Libraries like to share records. <laughs> we have access to, I think there's 40 of them in our database that we have access to that we can snag records from and do copycat records. Um, that's primarily what I do is a lot of the copycats. And then I do all everything J, so board books, picture books, J fiction, T fiction, large print, Harlequins. Harlequins are the only ones that are like technically original records for me because really I just copy them from like the previous year and change it so it's a previous month and change it so it's the right title, author, name, that sort of thing or like number of what, where it is sequentially. But it's easier for Amy on me doing all of the copycat stuff so she can just focus on the new ones. But it really just depends on how big Room Taylor does. Most of my stuff stays with me on those sections. Sorry. Most of my stuff I end up doing. Every now and then she'll get like a random picture book or something. Um, I actually have a pile upstairs that they need to give her because they just, no one has those records, period. Like I've looked at other libraries four or five times and they're just, not done because they're that unique of a book. We have one called No Platypuses Allowed, and it's pretty much on like not being biased, and nobody has it for whatever reason. No one has it, so I don't do original copies or like records, so Amy ends up doing them. So she gets a kind of backlog, but I try to keep as much of the stuff as I can so she doesn't have as much of a backlog from me. So yeah, and then, so I'm sure all of you know the difference between nonfiction and fiction. I would hope so. Yeah. <laughs> that was one of those. Um, for cataloging wise, it's interesting and annoying all at the same time because like fiction is so much easier because you just have the author and what genre it is. It's either just straight fiction, sci-fi, mystery, inspirational, or western. Like that's the only other categories that we do. Nonfiction, you gotta go dig for that Dewey Decimal, <laughs> and it's so annoying. <laughs> but it's necessary, so, and my, my biggest issue with nonfiction is like getting that right section, because there are so many different little niche collections in Dewey. The farther out you string those numbers, the more niche that like specific subject is. And you can always have it in the wrong area, because that other little tiny subject can also fit somewhere else perfectly, and it's on you to judge whether, well, we have stuff in this area already. Do I just throw it there or do I put it here? And it's a lot of jumping back and forth between your records and stuff. I have a faint memory of maybe big thick volumes um, from the Library of Congress, I think, and it gives you, you know, the decimal points to go like tenths to do that. Like, yep. ah. <laughs> we have one upstairs. <laughs> yeah, I, I, Oh my gosh. I mean, we actually have a couple because Amy has one and I know um, Brandon Patrick have one that they use for reading also. So, yeah. So, that number, does it come with the book or the, in here? That Sometimes it comes with it, rarely. Um, so, Amy's the one who does all of our nonfiction, J or adult. So, she's the one who has to deal with the Dewey decimals. <laughs> But um, most of the times it comes with like a general like 383 or something like that of like the big overall section and then like the point whatever is what we end up adding on because we have specific like, oh, well we only want it to this or, yeah. No, I did not know that. See, I'd like to have you go by the library of Congress. And I'd like to have the look of everything out there, except 
but I really didn't have like more than three or four uh, yes. decimal mm -hmm. numbers after decimal point. But and that's yeah. where our like section goes is we don't like to go beyond. I think it's five numbers. She I doesn't like beyond the decimal point typically. There are some up there you'll see with like seven or eight from her predecessor who was like, it has to be perfect in its section completely <laughs> and would have just these long numbers on it. And we're like, you can't find that on the shelf. Yeah. Do the smaller, so they're not necessarily like, they're in their overall category, right. but on like their tiny little box category, we do it so far out and then we're like, no, this is your category. You're not getting more focused right. than that. So yeah. well, that one is where it varies library to library. And that's about several people when they know that I, I take care of the books that are donated to St. Vincent's. Hmm. And, and so I obviously we're not used to the Jewish decimal system, hmm. right? but having worked in libraries before, I have a pretty good idea of what could go where. But I'll yeah. look at something and think, oh my gosh, when I put that here, gosh, that won't really. And it's like, it doesn't matter because nobody's going to look at that book and buy it anyways because we're at St. Vincent's. Yeah. So it doesn't really matter. And that's a lot of why I'm like, it just depends on where we already have stuff in the collection. And like sometimes with our like fables and fantasies and stuff like that, especially in the picture book section, like just our J nonfiction picture book, it just depends on where we think it'll serve, where we think it'll get the attention, and what all else we have there. There are quite a few times I'll take a picture book to Whitney that's like Little Red Riding Hood. I'm like, do you want this in nonfiction in our fables and fantasies chunk, or do you want it in picture book because it's in picture book format? So it just depends. Sometimes it's picture book. Sometimes she's like, well, it's a little too in depth. So we want it nonfiction, and then we have to go down the decimal line. But it just depends. We're pretty flexible, at least in picture books and like the J section, because we want it to serve. We don't want it to just sit down the shelf and never move. Right. It gets kind of sad when you pull a book off the shelf and you're reading, and it hasn't gone anywhere in four years, meaning it got checked in and never moved. And it's so sad. But sometimes that just happens. And especially in like the J nonfiction, so many of that just doesn't get used because a lot of parents are like, no, it's just nonfiction, facty things. There's other stuff over there too that you want. Educate them, like, sort of thing. And you're like, there's a lot of more than just like, oh, this is straight, boring facts. A lot of the J nonfiction is built for kids, so it's very picture book-esque style while still having all of that deep information. So it really just depends on the content of the book on where it goes in our collection at least. Because like we're looking for it to actually move off the shelf. If we have to sacrifice a technically non-fiction title to the picture book collection, we will. It'll actually move there. So well, I think crazy yeah. that some people have just dismissed the non-fiction out of hand and think, oh, it's going to be dull and boring. I yes. think some of the most exciting books. Not to, I mean, I yes. have many more boring fiction books <laughs> than I have nonfiction books. I'm not a huge nonfiction reader, but like the random ones I pick up, I absolutely love. Like I will advocate for them all day, every day, because I'm like, these are actually great. Like some of them are really dry, but other times it's like, no, this is amazing. <laughs> yeah. So it does. It just depends. Okay, and I did mention earlier, like on creating records versus copycat, rec copycat records. Anyhow, <laughs> so like that plays into those of like making all of that record, but we'll come back to that. Um, and then bib records versus item records, bibliographic, sorry, I'm used to shorthanding that one. Um, bibliographic records are typically what you guys see as the overall record and like, hey, you have this title, great. Item record is specific to each individual book. So like look at five James Patterson. We have one bib record for that five item records of that one particular book because with it, the bib record tends to match the ISBN and then the barcode on the book matches the item record. That way we know what that specific book is versus like, oh, well, we don't have any Twilights left. Well, we do have one, but it's in a record with 15 others that are not returned or missing or who knows what. <laughs> so like you'll find some that are like, oh, well, we have 30 of these. Some of those are all book discussion kits and we have none on the actual shelf. If that ever happens, we are more than happy to go get you from the book discussion, by the way, if you ever find those titles. <laughs> yeah, so those are the difference between those two. And I'm also gonna dig a little deeper into actually looking at bib records and item records, but I wanted to give a general overall. So, bib records, right into that 
uh, I'm going to talk to you again. Um, are there any other questions that anybody had or anything that like stands out in anybody's brain yet? Why did you get the phone number or get the other guy's number? What? Phone number and the other guy's number. So you call the number and they give you the directory of the phone number. You know there's something. Yeah, and you know there's something. Oh, yeah, no. What kind of name? That's why I was like, what? No. We can get you one of those. We really want it, though. But so what we're cataloging, this is a bibliographic record. This is the basic, like, it has publisher information, ISBN, the author's name, the title, the size of the book, different stuff like that. Um, age ranges, depending on if it's JPEG or not, like, whether it's middle grades, teens, whatever and a whole bunch of other like technical library things up at the top, so we just kind of ignore those. Um, <laughs> but so that's the primary thing we're looking for, especially in my case, because I do a lot of copycat. I find records from other libraries, but I have to make sure it's actually that book, so I have to match that ISBN to what's on the back of the book in my hand. Like we find the ISBN, and then after that, we put in our call number, quite quite a lot. There are other libraries' call numbers in there, so if you ever say like a weird call number, it's because one of us forgot to erase the other library's call number and it's trumping ours because it was put in there first and we didn't erase it and that's our bad. <laughs> so we put in our call number. Each library is different on how they do call numbers. No matter what, like you will find some that are the same, but it is so infrequent that I do not have to change a call number whenever I steal somebody's record. If I get it straight and it's just a basic record, I get it just put in our own and it's easy. Um, a lot of times this is just straight what I get from Baker and Taylor. I just have to fill in the little blanks and it's great. Sometimes though, I get four lines and that's it. <laughs> Cause I'm like, I can't do anything with that. So I have to go find it from somewhere else. Amy does the same thing, except she actually does something with those four little lines where I'm not supposed to, so yeah. <laughs> But we do call number, obviously that changes like depending on what category it's in. Mine are all JPEG picks because I work with the GA fiction. So you'll see a lot of juvenile titles today. Um, but Amy does all the ones that have like science fiction and all that stuff that's on it. Um, and then we do author. We have records for each author. They're called authority records. I did not think to put that in any of your stuff. That kind of flew out of my brain. But we have authority records for each author. That way we know it's the right author. There are so many authors that match names and we end up having to add whatever year they were born to when they died or if they're still alive or if they're an artist or different stuff like that. They'll have little random things added after it. So we have to match their authority record to the actual author so we make sure you can find all that author's work. So like if you just type in that author's name, that's why all of their works come up is because they're all linked to that one authority record instead of just like, oh, well, it kind of matches that name. Eh. Like, so that's those. What was it fun when you get an error message of like, this isn't right. And you're like, it matches perfectly. And it turns out you have one too many spaces in it. What was it fun? Um, and then the next one is title and author. Yeah, we have author on there twice, but that's just how it goes. <laughs> um, because technical records, what you see with the author is that first name and last name. So that line there is what you actually see in the catalog for like author, title, all of that. The others you don't necessarily see on that front page when you're like, oh cool, this is a record. You don't see all of this extra stuff unless you click on librarian view. Feel free to do that at any time and let us know if something's wrong, if you notice something. Um, and then right below that, I don't actually have an arrow pointing to it, I don't think, but this line right here um, is publishing information. So it was a Viking publishing sort of thing. And then we have to make sure that the page count and size is correctly marked. Sometimes that's just a blank spot. So, and we just have pages and centimeters and we have to put that in. Um, that's a big thing for us, especially in the J section, making sure they'll actually fit on our shelf. Not as big of a deal in the adult, because most of the adult books are the same size. J are not. So, yeah, that's what was the fun. And then you get like summaries and stuff like that in there. Lots of other 
kind of little technical things that don't actually mean anything to the general public at all and are just have to be there because we have to have them there to make a record complete. So there are those. And then item records. I'm so sorry, I have to keep taking this. Take a deep breath, too. I'm sorry, not while you're not while you're trying to drink. I don't have to be I'm not good at, you know. I'm I'm trying. <laughs> Talking and then I have to keep talking and talking and talking oh, until I, you know, don't breathe. That's fine. So yeah, that's a thing. <laughs> but then, so this is what you see for each specific item, and then you get. Oh, you can't really see that arrow. There's an arrow all the way up the top where it says barcode, like where that line of numbers is all the way up the top. If you're not really, you can't see that color well, you know. Um, <laughs> that's where the barcode is. So obviously, those barcodes on the front of the books. That's where that goes. So like up at the top on that one, you see the barcode. Right, go all the way back. Um, <laughs> like you see that barcode up top. Those are all printed specifically for us and like have our name on them. We get them printed frequently every year. And the, the two copies of the same book may have two different barcodes. They're Correct. aware which is where. Yep. So. Frequently, um, especially because like we send out notices and stuff when people don't return things. A lot of times people will come in and be like, well, but it's on the shelf right here. And we're like, that's a different copy. Like, well, how do you know? The barcodes don't match. <laughs> yeah, we're like, we, we have them separated out. Like, we know it's not the exact item that you have. Like, we promise. We're not just like trying to scam you. We promise. We don't really care about your money. Like, <laughs> that's not a big thing for us. Give us our stuff back. But, so yeah, the barcodes are very individualized to each and every single item. Um, all of ours start with three, two, eight, five, nine. So that makes it really convenient for us because if something is wrong with that chunk, we know it's wrong because that's every single one of ours. Um, I personally love it when the last numbers are always the same for like three in a row. It makes me happy. Um, <laughs> or this is a random nerdy thing for me. If I have a book about the Titanic come out and the last four are 1912, I get all excited and go nerdy on it because, you know, Titanic. Anyhow. <laughs> It's just cool to me whenever the bar number like ending code matches with the date happening in the book. I'm like, oh, that's so cool. It was destiny that it had this barcode. But that shouldn't be nerdy. Um, <laughs> and then call number is what you see on the spines of all of the books on those little white labels on the sides. We type those into there. Like I say, this is a J record, so you have that J up top. Typically, you just have thick and whatever the author's name is. Um, Sometimes you have inspirational, sci-fi, western. Um, we do something different for audiobooks and DVDs. Biographies are different. I think those are all ones that are different. Magazines don't get labels. Yeah, I think I got everything. So like obviously like where that J is, there would be nothing if it was adult because it's adult fiction, not J fiction. So that sort of thing, like the thick, because we're not going to write all fiction, you know it's fiction, you're downstairs. And then whatever the author's last name is, that changes depending on what section it's in. So like in our JPEG, we don't like authors in JPEG. We like sections. So like all of our superhero stuff, depending on what labeling brand it is, whether it's DC or Marvel, is under DC or Marvel. 
Marvel because these are for kids to find. Or Disney, our section that is getting completely out of hand is under Disney. And now I'm going back through and redoing all of the labels so that they say Disney and then whatever other section they're in. So it's Disney and princesses. And I'm really excited about it because I love recataloging things. Um, <laughs> or like Minecraft, different sections like that. We tend not to do that in adult though because adults are looking for specific authors and not general sections other than like, oh, I want sci-fi. Cool, here's our sci-fi section. Look for a specific author sort of thing instead of like, I want a princess book, <laughs> come with me, like that sort of thing. So we do things differently in the juvenile section than in adults. So if there's ever like anything I say that seems odd for the adult collection, call me on it because I don't always remember that we do things differently with my cataloging versus Amy's. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm real biased towards children because that's what I work with all the time. <laughs> But then collection, that changes. Um, that's one of our biggest indicators for if it's a new book or not. Um, that's where we're able to see like, oh, hey, cool, this is a new book, so we know to go look on that new shelf instead of sending you into the stacks to never find it. <laughs> or vice versa, of, oh, it's supposed to be on the new shelf. Oh, that got changed two weeks ago. Cool story, we'll go look in the actual stacks, sort of thing. That's the main indicator for that one. The material type changes based on whether it's audiovisual book, juvenile book, tape. I think we have one for just audiobook sort of thing. So that one's not like a huge factor, but it's helpful, um, excuse me, it's especially helpful with our My First Library card because they're only allowed to check out juvenile books. And sometimes it's super helpful for me when a parent comes up and is like, hey, this isn't checking out on My First Library card. And I'm like, oh, that's because we miscataloged it. It's technically marked as adult. We'll fix that, and then they're still able to check it out. But that's primarily what that's used for. And then the stat code also states whether it's like JPEG, TPEG, J Picture Book, all of those fun little categories that we have. And then obviously the price, again, important because then we know what to charge you if you don't bring your stuff back. And then whether it's circulating or displayed in the pack. <coughs> so non-circulating applies to all of our professional collection. We have stuff that we don't let the general public check out. A lot of them are academic books for us specifically or like library specifics on like cataloging and stuff like that. The general public doesn't need that. Or if we have picture books that we keep specifically for us to use for like story times and stuff, that's when we have the non-circulating. You guys can still see them, but you guys can't check them out. And then display in the pack. A pack is a personal access computer, so our public access computer, so that's what you guys will see. When you open up our catalog in general on the website or when we see them and stuff like that, that's what that means is you guys are able to see it in our catalog. When you're not able to see it in our catalog is typically if it's one of those we don't want it circulating sort of things, you guys don't even know we have it, it's not important. Or if it's never been returned. Those are big ones with not returns, missing, withdrawn, stuff like that. Those are the ones that primarily that applies to because if it's not returned, we're not gonna tell you, hey, we have this book because we don't have it. So we take it out of our records because you can't see that we technically have it because we don't have it. So that's why like also with missings and stuff, we don't know where it is. So we don't want you getting your hopes up that we have it when we don't have it. So that's that. Shelf location only applies to book discussions. All of those are in the basement, so that's a lot for us of like, hey, it's a book discussion, so we know it's in the basement. And then whether it says in process, if you guys ever have a book that you try to check out and it's like, ha, you can't check me out because we forgot to check it in, so it doesn't know that it's actually allowed to circulate. So we just have to check it in and get it out of process because it's still like, no, nah, this is still supposed to be upstairs. It's not. <laughs> so. These are the labels that you see inside the books. I'm sure all of you guys have noticed them on the books. What up? Do libraries get like discount or price? Yes, or yes we do. Um, I don't know exactly what our discount is, but I do know we do get discount. Yeah. Oh, I do have a book. So the right side, 
directions are hard right now. <laughs> the right side, there's another arrow that is very hard to see apparently. Um, we have special printers for our labels. So that's the one, <laughs> it's on my desk. Um, <laughs> that's the like tape, I don't remember what it's called. Yeah, anyhow, <laughs> so my brain is like, what is the tape called? Um, but it's like heat infused, so that's how you get the ink on it and stuff. But like that's the tape and then like the labels, obviously. And our actual labels, the smaller one is what you see on the spine of the books, and then the bigger one is what goes inside the book. And it's really important in the case of those labels because, especially that one, um, the Margarita, or no, Engel, Engel has a, an accent on it. And that messes with our font on there and it makes it all completely wrong and wonky and they're all just like different sizes and stuff. So that's why on our labels we have to pay attention to make sure that it actually prints co correctly. Um, because our computers don't like accents or any sort of weird thing in a word. Like there are just certain characters which completely shoot our fonts and making sure like we have that price correct and having the last four of the item on it because sometimes we mix up labels, <laughs> happens frequently, um, and don't actually get the right label in the right book, and then we have to go back and figure out what that label goes to, to make sure it gets on the right item, because sometimes a different item of the same title has the correct label, but not the right label. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes we don't pay attention. So we have to make sure they're the right thing and then the price. Processing. This is our lovely backlog. See, you kind of get to see some of Dexter. <laughs> That's the small little area that we do all of our processing in. <coughs> um, we have one woman who primarily does all of our processing, that's Sharon, I'm sure you guys have probably never seen her. She likes to hide and is very good at it. Um, but she gets all of our processing done. That was actually taken when she was out for two and a half months because she had her knee replaced and Summer and I were doing that working desk and all of our other responsibilities all over the time. So that's why there's so much of it. She tends to actually be right on the ball with it and not have that much backlog. We try our hardest to not have stuff sitting upstairs for too long because if it's sitting upstairs, it's not circulating and the whole purpose is for people to have access to it and to circulate it. So. Um, we have lots of Lots of stickers that goes on things. <laughs> so up in the top left corner, we're gonna kind of like circle around. I'm sure you can guess at what most of them are. The least used stickers are the ones up in the top left corner because the reference ones only go on things in the Ohio room. And we have a small little reference section, but those are things that can't go out of the building. Our Spanish collection, we don't have much in adult in Spanish. Those are primarily used in J section and then local authors we try to mark those and like brand them in our own way and be like hey this person lives close to Marion or in Marion you should read their stuff sort of thing we have different new stickers for each general collection all of the top new sticker is our nonfiction new stickers those only get applied to adult nonfiction below that is all of our J new stickers J and teen all get the same new sticker. They're not good stickers, they tend to fall off a lot, so they're stick less-ish. Um, the ones below them, like the Rising Sun, are all of our new fiction stickers. And then new large print stickers are below that. We also have little blue dots that go on our new audiobooks that I forgot to put on there. Um, and then all of our genre stickers, obviously, we have Western mystery, romance, sci-fi, and inspirational. On the next slide, I think? Yeah, okay. So next slide has J category-ish stickers that we used to use. And then large print. Large print gets its own special sticker because obviously it's large print. It goes in its own special location. But holiday stickers, we used to use them on our J picture books. We no longer use them or catalog any of our picture book as holiday books. We thought it was too clunky of a label and too many stickers, so we're just not doing it now. And then the random strips on the side for colors. Um, the top is technically yellow, even though it looks green. It's yellow. Um, and then yellow, pink, and green. Those are our systems for deciding what our levels for our e-readers are. In the children's section, we have picture books, e-readers, JPEG, and non -fic. 
e-readers are kind of that step between they're reading picture books or having them read to them. You're trying to get them to learn to read on their own before they go up to chapter book. So e-readers are like a big thing for parents, grandparents, babysitters, stuff like that. And be like, hey, cool, you can read now. Yeah, like, so like Go Jane Go, stuff like that. Those are e-readers. They're those easy spot word type books. We level those that way people know like, hey, these yellow ones with the stickers are the easiest. And then as they go up in color wise, they get a little bit harder. And then once you're not color labeled anymore, you're pretty much ready to go into chapter books. We, <laughs> I'm just like stop and think for a minute. We do not label any adult prize books. So like if it wins the Booker or the Pulitzer or anything like that, we don't label those. There are too many of those to count. Plus so many other just random awards that adult books win, we just don't label them. We only do the primary ones. Typically the only ones we have stickers for others, obviously, but typically the main ones we do in J even are the American Caldecott. That's primarily because we have students coming in from OSUM looking for those specific titles or teachers coming in, hey, can I have the new Newberry? And we're like, we don't know what that is. We do because we have it labeled. So <laughs> that sort of thing. A lot of times like they're just looking for those stickers rather than having to come up and ask us. So it's easier for them. So we have Newberries, the honor and the actual medal. And then I don't remember what that one is because we never use it. That one's the Margaret E. Edwards. Did I give you guys? I did explanations of what each of them are. Great, now I don't have to read them. <laughs> yeah, so the top one is the Margaret E. Edwards for teen adult, age, well, teen J-ish. And then the Prince, which is primarily used for teen. Yeah. Is teen and then Caldecott is other picture books. There's Prince and there's Caldecott. But obviously there are awards given on all levels for all sorts of everything in all books. But those are the only ones we focus on because those are the ones that people are primarily focusing on. I don't think I've ever had anybody come in and be like, hey, I want the latest booker. Nobody asks for that. <laughs> Oh, goody, I can show you guys the video we're covering this book. <laughs> so, I can talk through this because I didn't want to talk through it when I actually recorded it. But when we cover a new book, it's a fun process. Um, we put all the labels on different stuff like that. We have stamps that we put on them of the date. So that's especially important when we do um, street dates and stuff like that. It also helps us when we're reading later. Sometimes the date's missing. Correct. Mostly because we just failed to actually put the date in there. Because okay, sometimes I like to see what. Yeah, sometimes we just completely miss that stamp. Um, <laughs> but then we also stamp it with like our name and it's not the full address, it's just Marion, Ohio. That way, like, it ends up back at the right Marion. So I was putting on the spine level and the mystery sticker. And then I, weird when I cover books, I like to flatten my covers out as much as possible because it's easier to cover them. Mm -hmm. So, like, I fully uncrease it as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Because if not, it's just horrible to try to cover when you're, like, actually putting it in the cover. Yes, it is difficult. I have done that many times. <laughs> and we have, we have a board upstairs that we can like tuck them into up at the top, close to where the ink pad is. We tuck that in, that way it like holds it better. I don't like to use it. Um, we also have pretty much a bone stick that we can use to like flatten stuff out. But again, I don't like to use it, so I didn't. Um, all of our covers come with pretty stickies on them, but most of them we end up having to tape also. Um, I'm super tape and glue happy when I come to covering things, just because I want the cover to actually stay. So like I use a lot of tape. In that case, the piece of tape was because the cover, I'm gonna end up trimming it because we don't necessarily have the exact length. It's easier to just buy a certain length and then just trim it, which makes it easier for us. So yeah, that's always fun because you have to pay attention to not actually cut teeth. 
cover when you're doing it. Most of the times I miss the cover. That's what paper photos are for. Yeah. Yeah, I don't like those. <laughs> but then we have the tape gun and the glue to be able to actually put the cover on. Um, each of us is different when we cover a book. There's four or five of us that know how to cover them. Every single one of us does it differently. Um, Sharon has it down to a weird science that she can just flip through books super fast. I've never been able to cover them that quickly, but she's again been doing this for I think 10 plus years. So like she knows what she's doing. <laughs> she, you normally do this much more quickly than you're showing up. Right? Yeah. Not much quicker though, yeah. oddly enough. <laughs> I'm, I'm super picky when I like cover books and like them to be perfect, and I get really annoyed when they're not perfect and sometimes you need to cover them. Is that what you're talking about tape gun? Yes, yeah. um, that's double sided sticky tape, and then glue. <laughs> Actually, after I do these glue jobs, I end up with glue on my finger because I smeared my hand through it. <laughs> well, we didn't do all that when we covered books at the library. We just had, I just put a little piece of tape on the top and bottom. Yeah. Differently. Yeah. That would be much nicer to do for the yeah. Um so we order them through Brodart. Yeah, we order our covers through Brodart. Um there are multiple other huh, you guys know more about stuff. jacket covers um, there's those we also used to on some of our really old paperbacks you'll notice like that hard plastic yeah. shell on it those are just like sticky covers that we used to use but we decided they're not really super helpful so we just stopped using them we have cases upon cases upstairs because they just stopped and have nothing else to do with them so they're still upstairs I'm sure we could use them in like a kids project or something. We just never you actually done put those over the edge of the sale of stuff. <laughs> that would have been a good idea actually, but we don't always think of all these good ideas. <laughs> but then you have a finished product of having <laughs> of having the label, the new sticker on it. Um, we do a different type of covering when we do paperbacks because they don't have those dust jackets, so we obviously can't cover them in the plastic. We use the little stickers um, over that spine label. We call them band-aids. They're just big square stickers, but they look like band-aids. So we do those, and on large prints, if there's no plastic cover, which most of them don't have, they're all hard shell pretty much, um, we put a piece of tape over that large print sticker, that way it stays on. Why are some people in Arizona? Yeah, so like the new sticker and all of that. And then covering DVDs is entirely different. Obviously, it's a whole different media. We have donuts that we put on. Those donuts on the discs match the last four of the barcode. That way, when they're in the cases we have in the back, we can easily match to the right thing because we get four or five copies of every DVD. That way, we make sure people get the right disc for the right item. And that's the same. Like We still use the spine label. We do label dots on all of our DVDs so that we know um, where they go in the racks. Our DVDs are not in alphabetical order by any means, other than, hey, this is an A, great, it goes here. This is a J, sweet. That sort of thing, it's impossible to have them in actual alphabetical order on a regular basis. I don't do DVDs, but did you say you used to have a machine up there? We sure did. We used to have pods um, that had all of our discs in, that broke frequently, which is why we stopped doing them. Yeah, they like to eat the discs and just never give you the right thing, or spit out the wrong one because you would punch in where that, like what that movie was, and it was supposed to go to the correct pod and spit out the correct disc. It didn't do that a lot. We frequently get something entirely different, so we rely on man now instead of machine. <laughs> but yeah, like we don't alphabetize them other than like these are S's sort of thing. Each color, like dot, has a different meaning. We have, I'm on the next page, 
Green is drama, yellow is action, blue is comedy, orange is family, so like Disney type things. Purple is educational, which is in the kids section, and then stars are on our nonfiction. And then those numbers are on the cases and discs so that we can actually find them. We have these massive metal filing cabinets that we just have all of those little white sleeves in with discs that we just get to flip through and hope we know our numbers and hope they're in the right place. <laughs> so that's how we organize those and try to keep our stuff down. There are quite a few discs that we have that don't have cases because people take the cases and think there's a disc in it and then they're sad when they get home and realize they stole a piece of paper. Um, <laughs> happens more often than you can think. And then our audiobooks, we do our spine labels on the back, or not spine labels, the inside, the larger label that we put them on the back, and then like the spine label. And there's that little blue dot that I was talking about to mark them as two. Oh, hey, I put an error there. Cool. <laughs> and then like those call numbers are obviously like book on CD sort of thing instead of fiction or nonfiction and all that. Release dates, I pretty much covered all of this with our truth dates. Um, we have a shelf, like a full shelf location upstairs dedicated to street dates. Um, we have them split into like this current street date and then like outgoing street dates and that sort of thing. Um, you can't read the little signs below, but they're like, do not take anything from this shelf. <laughs> we do, um, <laughs> but like holds and stuff like that. We use a lot of pieces of paper just to mark of like, these have holes, so we know when we check them in, there's going to be a hole slip laying out instead of just straight putting it on the shelf. Or that's the date that it comes out at. That's how we do those. It's honestly just a lot of papers that get shuffled around and reused constantly until they're too small to be able to do anything with, so we have to get rid of them and start new. Old items. I'm probably gonna talk really quick because I got about 20 minutes to cover these last few slides in. Um, <laughs> it'll be great. So when stuff comes off new, we change the collection, as I mentioned earlier. Bonus, I have mentioned a lot of this before, so it makes it a little better. Um, but we change stuff off new. We take that new sticker off, that way it doesn't end up back on the new shelf. Every now and then, <laughs> you'll find a really old book on the new shelf. That is either because it's circulating way too much, too much, circulating a lot, and <laughs> just is never on that shelf whenever we're checking for old new stuff. Um, we tend to take stuff off every six months unless it's getting overcrowded and then we up that. It really just depends on how much space is on the shelves and how much new stuff we know is coming in. So like right now we probably leave stuff from June until probably mid-January. We'll start taking June stuff off just because we don't have space anymore. But there's always like a lull in publishing at the end of December. Like early December there's a lot and then end of December it's always kind of like a little lull unless just because everybody's doing holiday stuff and not paying any attention, so it's loads of fun. Not there yet. And then, yeah, no, we are there, okay. Um, <coughs> weeding is what you were asking about earlier when our books disappear. Typically we, re we weed every six months. It depends on each collection on how frequently we weed. In the case of our paperbacks, I had no idea I was in charge of weeding them, so they went two years without being weeded because Nobody was doing it because I didn't know I was supposed to be. Um, so it just depends on if we're paying attention to our collection like we should be, or if a person is out or stuff like that. In the case of our fiction, it's definitely every, Nicole is actually constantly weeding our fiction collection in like slow, small chunks just so that it's constantly being trimmed down and stuff like that to keep space. Um, space is generally our biggest issue when it comes to why we weed. We just don't have the space to keep everything. So if something ever disappears, feel free to ask for it on Interlibrary Road. Other libraries have more space than us, so they keep stuff longer than we do. We don't. Um, Out-of-date information, that's very pertinent in the upstairs section. Um, I actually have our collection policy in the back of that packet. Feel free to look through it. It's kind of a broad overview of how we decide what comes and goes in our collection and stuff like that. But really it just depends. Most of it is condition, if we have the space for it, if it's circulating. If it's not circulating, we're not keeping it. Like with the Harlequin, I got rid of those two collections. Two people had checked them out in two years. I'm not keeping those items, they're gone. 
right? There's no reason to keep those. There's no reason to keep buying that collection. It's not getting used. It's taking up space. Buy it. That can differ. James Patterson, he has an entire range to himself because he has so many, but so many people keep reading them. We can't get rid of them. Yeah, we don't have every single one of his, but we have all of his new-ish stuff. I think we're back to 2015 with what we have needed of his, but like anything before that, it's gone. We had to borrow from other libraries. When authors continually publish stuff, we can't keep all of their stuff. Um, so they get pulled out of our collection. Hey, I do have the stuff. So we change their stat records so that they're marked for each individual item as withdrawn. They get their barcode flashed out and a, yeah, barcode flashed out and a sticker saying canceled. All of those items go into our book sale. So if you ever are in the book sale and notice, hey, this has a barcode on it, it just got weeded. We didn't have space for it anymore and figure it can have a new life in somebody's house. So that's one of the better good decisions that sometimes you do. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what they do. Yeah, book sale. No, no, no. Somebody bought something at the book fair and read it, and then they donated it to the same thing. Every now and then. Their so. goodwill. We, our favorite thing is when somebody bought a book here at our book sale, read it, donated it to Goodwill. Somebody bought it at Goodwill, like written it back, and it's like, here, I have your book. And we're like, we appreciate it. But it's not ours anymore. But we appreciate it. Like, but we'll take it back if you really want. <laughs> but that has happened twice at St. Vincent's when I've been yeah. there. You know, books, I'll get a book that I'll look at, and I'll go, this looks like a library book, not from here. But there's yep. a look through, uh, there's nothing on it that says it has been yep. pulled. So it's a case of someone has moved, they just packed everything yep. up, and they're, so I would get in touch with, I think it's happened twice, I got in touch with the library, one was in Texas, one was somewhere else in Timbuktu. And I said, hey, send me an email. I said, I've got this book of yours. I said, what do you want me to do? And yeah. Said, oh, we've already pulled it, you know. Yeah, they're like, it's I done, said, it's gone. It's, it's fine. So I said, okay, I will flash out this information. Yeah. That's, a, yeah, that's, that's happened a couple of times. So does that one happen like, She came in daily because she knew we were constantly like putting new stuff out, collecting things that she thought could get a good price on Amazon or other resellers, and she was reselling them. Yeah, we're like, go for it. That's awesome. That's their little readers, and you know, yep. and every now and then somebody will come and say, "Thanks, you can do the same thing." Some of them, I mean, they're expensive. Yeah. But you know, they're they're reading them and they're like, "Oh, this is really good." Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nine times out of ten, they're just old library books they didn't have the space for, so they shuffled them out of the collection. Chuck is a weird word, I should not say that. We weeded them out of the collection. <laughs> but yeah, that's our whole thing with weeding is we just don't have a choice. We don't have the space for that. Oh god, I can't Okay. <laughs> but also with weeding, um, sometimes stuff gets a really long shelf life because people keep reading it. Um, we have stuff upstairs in our nonfiction collection that should have logically been weeded a long time ago because it's still from the Carnegie building, which we haven't been in in decades, but it's still circulating. Or in the case of nonfiction, we need it for common core reasons. There's nothing new on that subject. That's a big issue upstairs is like, there's just nothing new on that subject. So we have this super old information. Nobody's updated it yet. So as far as we know, it's still correct sort of thing. So that's fun. But like our travel books, constantly being weeded and rotated out with new ones because something new comes out every year. So it's fun like that. Book repairs. <laughs> Book repairs are fun because it's like when we're relabeling things of Disney and we did new labels because we decided to recatalog things. Pete the Cat is a picture book that is done by James Dean and he went back and forth three times twice while I was here at least, but a time before that of whether to put it under Pete the Cat or Dean for James Dean. 
they have four labels on them now because we kept going back and forth. And we're like, we're going to put it in D, or we're going to put it in D, and just it's constantly changing here all the time. Or in the case of like this first one, I wasn't paying attention when I cataloged the book and I forgot to put fiction and the call number on the label, so I had to redo it because I messed up. Or we spelled a name wrong or something like that, or we moved it from e-fit or just like a picture book to e-reader and stuff like that. Nine times out of ten when it's a label is Amy and I just wasn't paying attention and did spell wrong because for whatever reason. They're still finding things. Sorry, that was my alarm to warn me when we were getting close. They're still finding things from back in 2017 that I cataloged when I wasn't paying attention to most of my stuff because I was getting married. <laughs> so I was more focused on that. And they're just like, oh, hey, here's this book from 2017. I'm like, huh, yeah, my wedding was three days out from that. There's a reason. <laughs> so Real it's, preoccupied. Yeah, it's loads of fun like seeing some of the things that I'm like, oh, that's supposed to be a J and it's a G. My bad. Like, typos happen. <laughs> but then we also have the glorious people are not nice to books book repairs. Yeah. So we tape them up, stuff like that. We tape, we glue, we try our best, and sometimes you just have to replace stuff. Sometimes you just have to let it go because it's like that, and you can only work, like fix it so many times. Um, covers get ripped, we try to fix them as best we can. I think there was something else. Yeah, that was, that was it. That was wrong. Or like pages get ripped, we tape them as much as we can. DVDs get scratched, we clean them best we can. It just depends. But yeah, fun book repairs. Do you guys have any other questions? So how do you ask for this as a group to come in here or go to your limited library and ask for a reader book? Um, so we won't specifically just like take you to anywhere where we have reader books. No, I mean in here. Like how do I if they get into that reader book group or what do you tell? Yeah, we don't have the yeah. catalog. Yeah. So we don't have them anywhere specific, but a good chunk of what's in the market is weeded books from us. So, yeah. Yeah, definitely look at the book sale. There's a plethora because I know we've been fairly heavily weeding recently because publishing is picking back up again after COVID. So, we're trying to get ahead of the avalanche that's coming from stuff that. Now that people are out and about doing things again, that it's coming. Mm -hmm. Ebooks have put a damper on publishing also because a lot of people are going ebook, but there are some that refuse to go ebook, so they're all print. But yeah, it's I like the book book book. Mm -hmm. I'm all over the place. I like my new books, I like my print books, I like my audio books. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I was getting ready to say something, I'm like, that's not appropriate to say at work, so we're just gonna stop there. <laughs> well, if I would start walking again, I would be audiobooks. Yeah, I live a half an hour away, so audiobooks are my best friends. Oh, yeah. Thank you. This is really good. Yeah. I was saying, if you guys think of anything else, I'll be on the one desk time, the majority time, of my life, so. One time I had a book. Now, it could have been fake, I don't know, but it, it, it was signed by the author. And I, oh, when yeah. I turned it in, <laughs> I said, you know, you need to sign my name. You know, yep. they, they have the book sale, they have a special display of books for the sign of the author. And we do buy some that have been signed by the author. We also have some, like, if the author comes and visits, we try to get them to sign the ones in the collection. Well, this is the one, um, what's his name? Uh, it has the farm, or he had the farm. Well, the farm, 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 Nine times out of ten, I would say the author signature is probably valid, just because you have to actually find their signature to be able to forge it. So I just I actually wondered why it had been stolen by somebody who didn't even see it. You know, because it was worth yep. something. Like, yeah, some people don't even like know that they're there. Um, we had a teen author visit last year. I don't remember what next step came, but she signed all of our books and we bought a couple of signed copies and we're all surprised that they're still on the shelves because they just don't care. That or they haven't fully realized that, oh, this is a signed copy, this can actually be worth something. Like, sometimes people don't put two and two together and it works out in their benefit, so. How many people really yeah. stop and look at a title page, though? True story. <laughs> I, you know, I 